Welcome to Transform Now, a podcast focused on intelligent automation and brought to you by SSNC Blue Prism. On this program, we talk about how organizations globally are rethinking the way they operate, utilizing process orchestration and AI-enabled digital workers to free up humans to do the work that matters most. We also share insights and tips on how you can embrace this new way of working and unleash your full potential. Let's get into the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Transform Now podcast. I'm your host, Michael Marchuk. And I'm Brad Hairston. And this is our weekly pulse check on automation and AI news. Of course, you can find all the links for all the stories that we're going to cover today in our show notes. So, Brad, we got some good ones this time here. We do. So, so we'll start off with this one from uh, uh, the website Unite.ai. And the uh, title of the article is How the EU AI Act and Privacy Laws Impact Your AI Strategies and why you should be concerned. Now, we've talked about this concept of the legal issues that have applied, but now we're actually seeing some more governmental action coming in place. What are your thoughts on that? You can always count on the Europeans to lead the way with regulation, you know. <laughs> we, we Americans uh, tend to follow uh, after the fact uh, on that front. So I thought it was a really interesting article and it, and it you know it talks about the fact that while regulations are good there is concern that it's going to slow down innovation it's going to bog bog down developers who are looking to use generative ai uh, in particular so we'll see we'll see about that but it did, it also talks about these categories of risk that the european union has has uh you know put forward and the first one is, um, I think they call it unacceptable risk. So anything that's unethical, we, we all agree on that. The next category is high risk. And I was surprised by some of the examples they, they mentioned, like predictive maintenance and fraud detection and security monitoring through video analysis. Now, I understand how sometimes those things can, can present more risk or legal risk or things like that. But those those are solutions that companies have been using intelligent automation to solve for some time. And I was just surprised to hear those end up in that in that category. Do you think um, it's more of an autonomous type of thing? Like, hey, the uh, the airplane said that, you know, the airplane AI said it was this was OK and we didn't have a person look at it. And there and that's what happened with the crash is that failed and the AI just said it was OK. Is that kind of what you're thinking on? Yeah, that, that's that's very likely the case. And other aspects of the the new regulation are are not surprising. The fact that it's requiring more data transparency around the source data, around how the prompts themselves are being used. Um, I think I, all that's a good thing. And Michael, I don't know if you picked up on this, but it said that the fines that can be applied for non-compliance are pretty hefty. I think they said potentially up to 6% of a company's global annual sales. Wow. Global. Yes. I don't so think anyone wants to experience that. 6% yeah. of Apple's sales, um, 6% of Microsoft's sales. I mean, those are ginormous, right? Yes. Yes. Do you think they're trying to head towards that to head off these large companies with, you know, hey, listen, you need to pay attention to this because our fines will be, if you want to do business here, they will be stiff and therefore you have to mm -hmm. pay attention. Right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, as you say, um, the Europeans are leading the way to, to do this. I think it could be good in one way in terms of some of the protections that we really haven't had um, up to date. And, but again, there's a over-regulation and a moderate regulation and those type of things have to be discussed, I guess, in, in the future. So mm -hmm. well, let's move on to a second article. This is uh, found on MSN. Um, the article's titled, AI automation in the workplace is about to reach a major tipping point. And I know well, we've talked about this for quite a while, just in general. Um, and certainly with our careers, we've seen this probably for the past 10, 15 years is this, this, it's just about to happen kind of discussion. Um, what's different this time? 
Well, this, this article cites a recent survey conducted by Duke University and, and the Federal Reserve Banks in Richmond and, and Atlanta. And they, they surveyed CFOs. Um, they found that 60% of them plan to automate work that is currently done by employees. That's not really uh, new or different. I think we've, we've heard 50 to 60% of work will be automated. So the CFOs are on board, that's great. What's really interesting though, is 54% of those CFOs said they were gonna do it with AI. And that's a 17% increase from the prior year. Now, the question is, what's causing them to all of a sudden have this rampant trust in AI? You know, what what is is it is it the fact that they feel the peer pressure from their uh, competitors and and other industries? Is it that they've just seen enough examples to feel like it's trustworthy and they can put the right guardrails around it? Um, I really don't know, but I do think it's an interesting survey. I look forward to dig into it in more detail. Um, in my opinion, the the ability to leverage AI um, in, in, a, in a bigger way really depends on how they're going to do it at scale. And right. I, I think if they're not planning on doing that with digital labor, that's a pretty steep hill to climb. And quite frankly, they may never get there. Well, maybe there's also a misconception about the, the way that these AI tools can provide those, those kind of benefits. And like we've seen a number of times, you sort of lump everything to this magic AI bucket, which also contains a whole lot of other things in terms of databases and infrastructure and all kinds of things, but it's all under this magic AI umbrella. And it's possible mm -hmm. as a CFO, they may not necessarily be as technically savvy. So their thoughts on this would say, well, yeah, I've, I've seen some of the things, I've heard about them. And so I would expect us to be able to optimistically leverage that going forward. Maybe that's mm -hmm. part of it, I don't know. Yeah, agree. So as we're talking about CFOs, um, what are CFOs mostly interested in? They're interested about uh, getting returns on their investments. So we've got um, a very good article from VentureBeat uh, titled From AGI to ROI, the six AI debates shaping enterprise strategy in 2024. So I thought this was a fantastic article. They did a great job um, outlining these 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 specific activities and this, these six specific um, uh, tenants that they, they went and explored. Maybe you could discuss this a little bit with us because I think this is really interesting. Yeah, I, I love the article as well. I think it I think it really is comprehensive and covering the the key areas of debate around Gen AI. And the author put this article forward as a precursor to their event that they're having next week. I think it's called VB Transform and it's, uh, it's next week. Um, boy, I wish I was going just after hearing all the speakers and panels they're gonna have. Me both. Pretty much a who's who list in, in the world of AI. Um, but a few of the points it brings forward that I that I just thought were most interesting. One is this idea that the LLM race is over for now, meaning we don't need we we have hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of LLMs that have been developed that are available for companies to consume. We don't need 200 more, 300 more. We will continue to see more get developed over time, but. The article makes the point that we've kind of reached a crescendo on that front. It also talks about the fact that, you know, while there is an arms race around hardware, um, you know, we talked about NVIDIA. Um, I think, you know, N NVIDIA is right in the middle of that. Um, but it mentions that most companies are not feeling it because they're, they're using cloud-based platforms like Google right. and AWS and Azure. So they're letting those companies feel the you know sweat the cost of the gpu uh build out if you will um and i also saw a mention of alternative hardware starting to to crop up a lot more like quantum computing i i had um a guy come on the podcast uh a while back and talk about quantum i think i need to get him back on and talk about the role that this could play uh with ai um there was also a point about the legal issues around data um, that are that that's used to train models. 
it it made the point that it may take a decade to unwind all those issues. So we may not see regulatory um, uh, moves to try to address some of that. So that was kind of an interesting point. And then the final thing I saw that just was really interesting, it talked about AI agents, which are starting to come up a lot more um, in, in different circles. Um, it mentions that, you know, the, these are yet another plateau that we're gonna reach where you have these agents that are fully autonomous. So it's not just AI that you're programming to do some amazing things. They have the ability in and of themselves to go and execute processes or move data around or um, you know whatever whatever the the, the the agent determines to be the next step. Um, it mentions that this is definitely where we're headed, but it's a pipe dream for now. We are yeah. nowhere near being at that level. And it kind of cautions uh, people from getting too, too uh, um, enthralled with the whole idea. You know, we may get there at some point, but right now, and this is the spirit of the whole article, I think, Michael, is we, c we need to continue to have big vision, but we need to focus on practical implementation of Gen AI in the near term. And that's and what most companies are still trying to do. And we're, we're kind of at that place where the hype is dying down. Now companies just want to make sure they get it implemented somewhere in the in the most reasonable and safe manner. Um, the really big ideas for Gen AI should still be there, but probably not going to happen in the near term. And I think all of our our organizations has CFOs who are really looking for that. They want that return on the investment. They they understand they have to be competitive in the market. They understand these tools are there, but they also want to see you know spend the money wisely as we're doing these investments to make sure that they're going to get the return that they expect from it. Um, one of the, I think the best quotes out of this um, came from uh, Steve Jones of Capgemini in the article quotes him saying, AI is more of an organizational change than a technology mm -hmm. change. And I thought that right. it's very, very um, you know, forward looking because quite honestly, people are looking yeah. at so much more of the technology but the reality is this is changing how we see our business, see our, how we see our jobs, how we see our processes, how we see our customers mm -hmm. and interact with them. So it's an interesting uh, interesting quote and I really appreciate the way he uh, he laid that out. So our last article, and I know we have a bonus article this week. Um, I thought this was hysterical and I had to get your take on it. So uh, this is from uh, Fox News uh, on, M on MSN. They are, uh, the title of the article is, why 25% of Gen Zers bringing, are bringing their parents on job interviews with them. So, um, Brad, I'm interested to hear your viewpoints on why 25% of Gen Zers are bringing their parents with the job interviews. Yeah, I love this article. Um, we, we talk on this podcast about, you know, all, all future of work kind of issues. So this is certainly one of them. I was surprised to see this. Um, I have a Gen Z child. I think you may as well, Michael. Um, or maybe yours are the generation before. Well, but mine are both millennial. Okay, they're both millennials. Well, I have one one Gen Z child. Uh, he did recently ask me to help him with his resume, and um, but but by no means did he ask me to come to an interview, or will he ask me to come to an interview? Uh, but I think, I think it is a it is an interesting observation. Um, the article doesn't really give depth around why are they doing it. It just talks about well, maybe they're 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 they feel like they need to have that parental support, not just on the prep, but also during the interview. If something comes up, maybe mom or dad can speak on their behalf or help them with something. I don't know. Maybe they think it'll put the interviewer at ease. Uh, or, or maybe they strike a chord with each other and that helps their case. But um, the article does say most employers do not smile on a, a, a candidate bringing their parent with them. So if you're out there Gen Z's and you are Gen Z'ers and you hear this, don't do it. Don't bring your parent. <laughs> not a good idea. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Um, again, I think, I think there's a, it gets back to the whole this particular generation has had the whole participation trophy thing along with the, the millennials as well where we've had parents who are trying to protect them and and as they grow up 
um, mm-hmm. which can be good, but there's an, there's an overdoing it part. And right. as we all know, getting your jobs, getting your first job or your second job, you says that part of adulting, which you make that transition from being a child to being an adult. Yeah. There's no safety net sometimes on these things. And you need, you need to realize that maybe yeah. I'm not good enough for this, right. or maybe I'm the best person for it, but I need to express it in a way that these people can understand it. So um, yeah. interesting article. I thought it was kind of funny just because I cannot imagine trying to interview somebody and having their parents <laughs> in, in the same place to, to kind of help them along. So anyway. Yeah, definitely not. And, and I do think there's uh, the Gen Z um, generation is poised for great things. I mean, this is the first generation Indeed. that has has grown up entirely in the internet age and they're now early in their career right as AI is, you know, blossoming. So I, th- I think uh, I think this generation um, of workers in the in the workplace are are going to have a huge impact on where things go from here, and they're they're a smart bunch. I tell you what, I I, uh, I can sit around and talk with them all day long just about technology and and just the way society and everything is evolving. And um, uh, yeah, I have I have high hopes for them. I just hope they don't bring their parents with with them to interviews. I can agree with you on that. So, all right, if you have not liked and subscribed this, please subscribe. We will get you out very interesting content, either opinions from Brad and I, the two knuckleheads, as we listen through some of these uh, articles that we go through every week, but also from real experts that we interview um, that really find out what's going on now, both now, but also as we prepare for these future states uh, that are fast approaching. So we hope to see you next time on our, our podcast here at Transform Now. Thank you for listening to Transform Now, the podcast from SSNC Blue Prism. You can find all of our episodes on your favorite podcast channel, as well as YouTube. To stay on top of the hottest topics in the world of intelligent automation, subscribe now. The future of work is here.